will tell you what to do. But it is wisdom that will tell you how to do it. Everything that must be accomplished by the people of God must always start with the voice of God. So there's got to be an inner trembling in your heart at the sound of His voice. Father in heaven, I am more than a conqueror. I am a son. I am a daughter of the living God. If God is for me, who dare be against me? You are my strength. You are the rock of my salvation. You are the light of my hope. God is with me. I shall succeed. I am blessed. I'm highly favored. I am surrounded by God. I have the light of God in my heart. And I have the sword of the Spirit in my mouth. Therefore, Lord, I shall stand. I shall succeed. I will overcome. If God is on my side, I am already a victorious overcomer in Christ. So I open the heavens now. Lord Jesus, I ask you by the Holy Spirit to come and invade the atmosphere of this meeting this morning. I open my heart and my mind for your instruction and for your living word. In Jesus' name, amen. So the prophet Elijah has a great day in ministry, but the day after... He has a tremendous attack upon his spiritual position, his spiritual stature, and his understanding and knowledge of God. And while he has to run for his life after she threatens him, he comes to a place where after the angel meets him and tells him to go to a mountain and there will be There'll be an encounter and there'll be a meeting with God. God has scheduled a meeting for you. He now already premeditates what he has to say to God and what it's going to be like. He does not feel strong in himself. Because on Mount Carmel, there was a great demonstration of God's power and glory in his life. But the next day when Jezebel sends him a threatening message... He looks for the faith that all the time in his life protects him. And as he looks for this faith, the faith is no longer there. He does not understand what's going on. He cannot explain. He cannot interpret. He cannot put into words what he is feeling and experiencing in his, in, in his own self. And while he's in this condition, he just wants to die. And he wants to give up. And when it's time that you must push through. Many people, they just want to give up. Now it's the time. Like never before, this is your hour and this is the moment for the man and the woman of God to go through. And to say, God, you will strengthen me and you will come alongside me and you will lift me up. And as he comes to Mount Horeb, which is the mountain of God, or Mount Sinai, he finds himself in a cave. You guys know the story. And he, and he starts a conversation. God speaks to him and he answers God. God asks him another question. The same question. What are you doing here? Why have you come to a place where you have no vision anymore? <laughs> Why have you come to a cul-de-sac? Why have you come to the end of the road as you see it? Because just before that, he asked God, please take away my life. I can't see the way forward. I can't see what is the plan that you have for me. I cannot see the next few steps that I must take. Here I am, I'm the prophet, I'm the one who is, who is the sent one, I'm one, the one who is enlightened by the Spirit of God, and I cannot see the way forward. And God asks him again, yes, I can see you in this place, but why are you here? Have you come to this condition? And he answers God, and he gives the same answer. If God asks you the same question, that he just asked you in the cave, and now he's standing outside of the cave, and God asks him this question again. He gives the same exact answer. 
then probably it's time for you to reconsider your answer. And then God speaks. And when God now speaks, God is not condemning. God is not blaming him. God is not looking to the past. God is simply looking to the future. Because God sees a future that Elijah cannot see. Even this mighty man of God, even this great prophet, came to a place in his life where he could not, he could not understand, he could not work it out, how he must go forward. What is the next few steps that I must give, that I must take? And as God now begins to speak in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15, God shows Elijah that God is not without a plan. That God knows where he should go. And that God has everything already programmed. If we can submit ourselves and align ourselves and come into harmony and in rhythm with the Spirit. Because it is possible to have the Holy Spirit and yet be out of tune with what he wants to do. Because we are so self-willed, because we are so driven by our own understanding and by our own opinion that we cannot pick up what is, what is the message that God wants to bring. Then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. In other words, God is saying to him, Elijah, you walked 40 days to get here. Now you're going to walk 40 days to go back. And I want you to go and meditate upon that which is not in the past, but which is right in front of you in the realm of the Spirit, which is the fresh thing, the next thing that God wants to do. Because God is always interested in your future. And God has, God has, your, has your prosperity and your advancement and your success on mind. So he says, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, <laughs> so watch this now, guys. When you get there, this is what you've got to do. Number one, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. In other words, Syria is going to get a new king. Number one, that's what he's got to do. When you arrive there, and also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of so-and-so, as king over Israel. Israel is also getting a new king. Can you see there's a lot of new things that are going to take place now? When Elijah came to the end of himself, when he came to the end of what he understood his ministry to be, and he could not see the way forward, God had so many things planned already. <laughs> the end in your understanding is just the introduction. It is the bells ringing for God to show you what he has already scheduled. That will govern and that will guarantee your success in ministry, in life, in business, in relationship. doesn't matter what it is. God knows what is the way forward. But all you have to do is listen. And so you will anoint so-and-so as king over Israel. And then finally says the third thing is you shall anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel, so-and-so, as prophet in your place. Verse 19. So can you guys see God gave him instruction? So what is the instruction? Number one, Syria's got to get a new king. Number two, Israel is going to get a new king. And number three, the prophetic office in this nation of Israel is going to get a new prophet. <laughs> But God, I was the only one. Uh-uh. You think you're the only one that's going through a hard time. You think you're the only one that's going through difficulty. You're not the only one. But God, why couldn't I see the way forward? God, why couldn't I discern what it is that I should do? You know what, Elijah? You became intoxicated. Because you became over-involved with your part in the ministry. <laughs> you became over-involved in your part in the family. You became over-involved in your issues at the workplace. And because you became over-involved, you became intoxicated. And the suffering of your experiences has now blinded you to see what is happening around you. And you could not pick up the now thing that God wants to do, the next thing that is about to be revealed. Because a prophet is someone that is anointed to look into the future and bring out of the future what others cannot see and bring it and demonstrate it and speak it and declare it with such authority that it is as if they can see it, although it's still there. 
So a prophet is by mere design called to live in the future. And here is a prophet, he cannot even see the next step he must take. So God says, don't worry about that, son. I know you've been very zealous, you've been very passionate for the kingdom. But I want you to do these three things. And God puts it in a particular sequence of, of events. Number one, Syria. Is that right? Number two, Israel. Number three, it's the prophetic office. So he departed from there. <laughs> and he found Elisha. So he went looking for the prophet first. But wasn't the instruction that you go and look for the king of Syria? The man that must be anointed. The new king. Shouldn't you stop at the top? Shouldn't you start with the kings? Because they run the show. They have the power. They have the authority. So how come did Elijah turn it around? When you put your hand to the plow and you get tired and you want to look behind you. You're not fit for the kingdom. If you've come so far that you can actually put your hand to the plow, then it's easier to continue than it is to turn back. So don't look back in your Christianity. Don't look back and don't turn back on your original decision to serve Christ. There is no other road. There is not an alternative. You're either going to serve him or you're going to serve the devil. You don't want to serve him. He is not a friend of yours. You have no option but to serve God. And if you're going to serve him, you, you might as well serve him with everything that's in you. Come on. Don't hold back, precious child of God. Serve him with everything that's in you because it's the only life you have. is the life you now have. Well, I'm going to answer this, this question just now. I first want us to go to Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2. Because I want to show you a man that is, that is easy to find, easy to locate in the spirit and in a conversation about grace. Grace will find this kind of guy. He says, has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being. This is the story where, where God asked Elijah, what house shall you build for me? Where is the place of my dwelling? In verse 1, let's maybe go there as well. This is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you were built for me? I mean, how incredible is God that he, he says that the whole earth is where I put my feet. And how, how are we going to build a house for me where you're going to fit me in completely with my feet and all? <laughs> and he says, the earth is my, is my footstool. That's where I put my feet. You guys are going to be busy to build me a house. So let's cancel the contract. Has not my hand made all these things and so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I esteem. This is the one that I favor. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The one who trembles at my word. The one who is humble. The one who is contrite of spirit. The word contrite means there is a brokenness in your spirit. Not a brokenness because of broken issues in your life. But a brokenness in your spirit because you see the distance and the difference between God's standard and when you are. So when God began to speak to Elijah before God spoke to him, he saw himself as the only prophet in town. He saw himself as being very zealous and he saw himself reaching the standard. But when God started to speak to him and God started to show him the way forward and things that he didn't know and that it's even perhaps time for his own ministry to be handed over to another prophet. <laughs> when he began to see how wrapped up he was in his own life and how intoxicated he had become with his own experiences and the suffering of his own of his own circumstances and condition and situation because everybody's going through a difficulty sooner or later somehow somewhere whether it's in the past or in the future there's going to be a challenge there's going to be something which is difficult for you is that right or is it just easy and plain sailing to be a christian if you want to be a shallow Christian, 
<laughs> then you can say to God, God, I want my life to be a good life. I want my life to be an easy life. I want my life to be a blessed life. I want my life to be enjoyable and it must be a nice life. And that's what I call a blessed life. So God, please can I have a blessed life? God will give you that. But just remember, that life is going to make you a shallow Christian. And if you are a shallow Christian, it is not possible to bring forth the deep things of, of God. The things that can change a nation. The things that can change a community. The things that can bring transformation in families. And bring restoration where there is brokenness. Rescue children. Rescue divorce issues. Broken marriages. If you want to bring forth the deep things of the spirit, you've got to say, God, yes, I want a blessed life. Yes, it can be easy at times. Yes, God, it can be <laughs> enjoyable and fun and all of those things. But God wants to put something at the top of the list. And you know what God wants at the top of the list? He says, son, before you ask for a nice life and a good life, ask for a worthy life. A life that is worth living. In other words, God, I want to be a Christian where all the people in my world can benefit from my life. What is people able to benefit from my life? And so while, while Elijah was comparing and when he was looking to what God was showing him, because it's, there's no sense in comparing yourself with yourself. But when Elijah saw Christ face to face, he saw God face to face. There was a brokenness, a contrite spirit in him. And he realized, God, I'm not there where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know how to get there. Humility says, I don't know how to do it. Humility says, I don't know how to get there. But humility also says, but yet I will not give up. Yet I will trust in him. Yet I will seek him. I will not sulk, yet but I will seek. I will not surrender to my enemy, but I will overcome. And soar above. And so he kept on walking. He said, God, one thing I understand is faith will tell you what to do. But it is wisdom that will tell you how to do it. Come on. So near you is the word. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. The word in your mouth is the word of faith. But the word in your heart is the word of wisdom. So now Elijah's going and says, God, I know what I must do now. You spoke to me. So the word of faith is I will go and I'll go anoint the new king of Syria. So he's walking. <laughs> he's got enough time. There's 40 days of walking. So his faith is strong. But his faith needs to be governed. And his faith needs to be perfected by his wisdom. So while he's walking, saying, God, how must I do it? And while he's talking and thinking, shall I go to the king of Syria? Is it now the time? God said first Syria. Then he said Israel. And then he said what? The prophetic office. And while he is thinking these things, you know what God says? The man that I choose, the man that I favor is the one who has a contrite spirit, who has humility in his heart, and guess what? Who trembles at my word. So there's got to be an inner trembling in your heart at the sound of his voice for when he will speak. That means you are constantly aware that God might at any time drop something into your spirit. Your spirit is your spiritual heart. So while he's thinking, God, how, how am I going to do this? He gets it in his heart, not Syria first, neither the king of Israel, but go to the prophet first. He says, well, but God, that's not how you said it to me. Yes, that was my instruction. But I'm sharing with you my wisdom now. So he picks up the word of wisdom. <laughs> because what is the wisdom to go to the prophet first? Everything that you have to do for God, everything that must be accomplished by the people of God must always start with the voice of God. <laughs> so go to the prophet first. Because the prophet represents the voice of God. And so see, if I have spoken to you correctly, son, go to the prophet and anoint him. Because there is a prophet in you. There is a prophet in every one of us. 
that you have to go to a place where you can meet with God, where God will surely speak to you. And what he speaks to you is going to be life. And it's going to put everything into motion that is necessary for the man and the moment and the movement of the spirit. <laughs> when he saw Elisha, obviously by the spirit, because now the word of faith told him what to do, but now it's the word of wisdom that tells him how to do it. Because even if you know what to do, if you don't know how to do it, when you do it, it's going to be so difficult and so hard, it's going to discourage you beyond your wildest imagination. If you say, I, I'm a Christian, that's what I must be, but you don't know how to be a Christian. Isn't it great when the Holy Spirit strengthens you in your serving God? When the Holy Spirit helps you to obey God. When the Holy Spirit empowers you to live holy, to live righteous. When it's through the Spirit and it's no longer through you. That is why before Jesus will return on the clouds, he has to wait for Christ to be revealed in the hearts of people. Because he's coming back for his own victory, he's not coming back for your victory. And if Christ is not revealed, what is the story of your victory? Even if you have some marginal success, it's still your own story. It's not a true story. Because the story of your life must be based on the power of his life. Then your, then your story is, is based on the true story. And the true story is Christ's story. Come on. Is there anybody in the house this morning? Okay. So now he sees him and he thinks, oh, this is how I'm going to anoint him. And, and the spirit just tells him, take your jacket. Take your mantle. And throw it on him. You know, so we've, we've done it and we've seen it so many times. You know, it's easy to take your mantle and throw it on him. Because you are led by the Spirit. But you know what it implies. You know what it means. You know what it signifies. The mantle that Elijah wore was the stature that he had before the people. When they said, did you find Elijah? Was he the man that, man, he wears a, a leather belt. And a cloak that is a camel hair. There was a particular way, a particular image that was unique to Elijah. So for him to take his jacket off, he does not know for sure whether Elijah is going to follow him. He does not sure, he doesn't know for sure whether he's going to get his, his mantle back. And everything that he had accomplished, everything that he was who he was, was recorded and represented by that mantle. So he asked, when he took off his mantle, he had to divest himself of everything that was his honor. And that was his anointing. And that was his ministry. So when he took his mantle off, he made himself naked. And he put himself in a place and says, God, if you don't bring my mantle back, I have nowhere to go. Because nobody likes me and everybody wants to kill me. I want to eat worms. Don't feel sorry for yourself. You are secure in Christ. So when he took his mantle, he said, well, whatever happens, happens now. <laughs> if this guy looks at me and I throw him with his mantle and he throws me with his stones and he picks up, he comes with that, that plow and 24 oxen and he's got a big crowd with him. All his servants. So he's taking a risk. But what so touched my heart that Elijah was now willing to put himself in a position where he does not have an office anymore. So he takes his entire prophetic office and he costs it. Throw your bread on the water and after many days, it wasn't many days, immediately <laughs> he could see that surely it was the Lord who spoke to him. Surely it was the Lord who spoke to me because I can see God, you've prepared him. Because the moment this mantle touched him, he responded with absolute and complete and utter obedience. He heard God in his spirit and everything in him began to shake. And his foundation was suddenly and it was immediately made clear. The foundation of this man of God, Elisha. And Elisha went and followed him. So God said this to me, son, don't be afraid of suffering because suffering is for your benefit if you have the wisdom to interpret it. And if you can see that the, the, the purpose of your suffering 
is to bring you to a place of divine wisdom and understanding where you can see things as God sees it. And the moment you can see your life as God sees your life, you can begin to operate in a dimension that was not possible before. You don't have just to move on and just try to survive. Listen, it is a sad thing to see Christians that are saved but not satisfied. Just trying to survive. Survive spiritually. They can make a lot of money, be successful. Or don't make a lot of money and don't be successful. Doesn't matter. It is the issue of your spiritual success. The accent, the stature, the mantle, the authority that you know who you are. If you can know what God knows about you, your life will never be the same. So don't focus on the suffering of your past or recent experiences. Focus on the purpose of your past and recent experiences. And in this way, you will be ready for the next thing. So the moment God shifted Elijah's, Elijah's focus on that which was his past, where there was no prophet like him in his own, in his own estimation. In fact, he thought he was the, low, the only one left. Come on, saints. How deceived is that? How can you be so overwhelmed and overtaken by your own experiences in your own life that you cannot see, you cannot pick up, you cannot recognize what's going on around you? <laughs> I mean, I know people, when they talk to you, they always talk to you about their children, about, it's the same thing, it's, it's like a grid. Ding, 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 it's not even, it's just the same. Because that's their lives. And they cannot see a bigger life to live. Uh, they don't pick up the frequency. They don't pick up the, the impulse of a spiritual high place. An excellence to move beyond your limitations and begin to live a worthy life. Not just a nice life, but a worthy life. A life where everyone in your world can begin to benefit from you. That's what I want. That's what you were created for. 